Good afternoon and welcome to the Tufts Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy webinar entitled Healthy Eating, Nutrition Facts, Myths, and Science Gaps with Dean Darish Mozaferian. My name is Dr. Rachel Pajednik and I will be your moderator this afternoon. I'm a Tufts Nutrition alumna and graduated with my master's degree and PhD from the Biochemical and Molecular Nutrition Program at Friedman. I did my work with Dr. Roger Fielding in the Nutrition Exercise Physiology and Sarcopenia Lab. For the past six years, I've been up the road at Simmons University in the Nutrition Department, but more recently, thanks to COVID, have relocated to the Green Mountains of Vermont, where I'm now an Assistant Professor of Health and Human Performance and the Director of Exercise Science at Norwich University, which is the oldest senior military college in the United States. Now, before I introduce our speaker, Dr. Mozaferian, I'd like to start you thinking about the topics that he'll be covering, which include nutrition facts, myths, and science gaps. And if you know me, you know I love a webinar about nutrition myths and facts. So I have a question for you all to consider, and please answer in the chat, which is just to the right of your screen. The question is, what do you currently eat to be healthy? Again, please put your answers in the chat to the right. While you're answering, it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mozaferian. Dean Mozaferian is a cardiologist, dean, and Jean Mayer professor at the Tufts Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy and professor of medicine at the Tufts School of Medicine. His work aims to create a food system that is nutritious, equitable, and sustainable. Dr. Mozaferian has authored more than 450 scientific publications on dietary priorities for obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular diseases, and on evidence-based policy approaches and innovations to reduce these burdens both in the US and globally. He has served on numerous advisory roles and his work has been featured in an array of media outlets. Thomson Reuters has named him as one of the world's most influential scientific minds. Now, before I turn it over to Dr. Mozaferian, I'd like to let you know that you can put your questions in the chat during the presentation. Please know that we've received several questions prior to starting today, and we will balance pre-submitted and live questions at the end of the presentation. We're sorry if we can't get to every question, but we'll do our best. Dean Mozaferian, please take it away. Thank you. So nice to be with everyone here virtually. And thank you so much, Rachel, as one of our uh, alumni, you know, presenting here. Our, our graduate students are indeed the school's uh, most outstanding and important um, um, achievement. Um, I'm going to be talking in just 30 minutes about all the nutrition facts, myths, and science gaps around health, healthy eating. Obviously, a huge, huge topic. We could do an entire course or indeed an entire degree on this topic. But I'm going to go quickly uh, uh, and, and hopefully leave time for questions through what I think are the, the really the big picture points uh, that, that uh, are true in nutrition science today. So first, you know, nutrition facts. Food nutrition is the number one cause of poor health in the United States and around the world. This chart shows causes of death in, in one year in the United States with hundreds of thousands of deaths along uh, the, the bottom axis and poor diet exceeds every other modifiable cause of, of death and disability in the United States and again, globally, largely due to chronic diseases such as cardiovascular disease. Um, you know, and, and the fact of how sick we are is just startling. More Americans are actually sick today than are healthy, and it's almost overwhelmingly due to food. One in two adults have diabetes or prediabetes. Three in four adults are overweight or obese, and only one in 10 adults are actually metabolically healthy if you look at kind of basic metabolic risk factors, only one in 10 huge, huge economic cost to this, not just human suffering, but economic consequences. In just 50 years, healthcare costs have skyrocketed from about 7% of our economy to 18% of our economy, from about 5% of federal and state budgets to almost one in three dollars in the federal and state budgets. This is absolutely suffocating, devastating our economy. And this is worst of all, diets are worse among children, actually, you know, worse than any other segment of the population, which, which really um, is incredibly foreboding and, and really wor should worry us for the future. 
not only do children have very poor diets, but there's, there's tremendous disparities uh, in, in children's diets. And so this chart shows you the percentage of US children with poor diets, not even okay diets, but poor diets in the United States um, uh, overall and by race, ethnicity, poverty, uh, uh, family income and household food security. So overall, even, even among high income children, uh, Caucasian children or, or households with uh, you know, good food security, 40 to 50% of all kids have poor nutritional diets. And you know, among more marginalized or other households that have suffered from you know, structural disparities, uh, you know, it gets over half. So about half of all kids in the United States have poor quality diets, really, really worrisome for the future. Um, th the costs of this again are incredible. This is a wonderful report that just came out from the Rockefeller Foundation. They estimated that uh, we spend directly on food about $1.1 trillion per year. And at the same time, in addition to that $1.1 trillion that we spend on the food system, the, the, our, the food system costs our economy $2.1 trillion in excess preventable costs. About half of that is due to consequences for human health, largely chronic diseases, but also uh, lost, lost uh, economic output from consequences for the environment, for biodiversity, uh, for, uh, uh, for lost productivity and, and, and livelihoods and poverty. So think about that. For every dollar we spend on food in the United States, our economy loses $2. Now over, over 10 years, 2.1 trillion a year is about $21 trillion. To put that $21 trillion in perspective, all of the infrastructure arguments going on right now uh, in Washington DC are about an infrastructure bill between two and $3 trillion. So if we could just reduce the harmful consequences of food by one tenth, just by one tenth, we'd pay for the entire infrastructure bill. This is not small change. And now the public is incredibly confused because there are facts, there are, are, are myths and there are emerging gaps and they don't know where to turn what source on the internet is reliable. Um, but you know, um, fortunately I'm here to say that the science has exploded and we have incredible new science to begin to address some of these facts and myths and emerging areas. This is a chart of scientific publications uh, in every decade since 1960 through 2020 on diet and cardiovascular disease, diet and diabetes, diet and obesity. And you can see every decade, the science is doubling. And so much of what we've learned actually is after 2000, just the last 20 years. And yet much of that information has not yet been transmitted to, to the public. So what are some facts? Fact number one, we have to focus on healthy foods beyond with, with, with the exception of some additives like sugar or salt, really nutrients shouldn't be a major concern. It should be about healthy foods. And it isn't about eating everything in moderation. It's, it's actually not, not about eating everything in moderation. It's about eating more protective foods, then eating some foods that are more neutral for health in moderation, and then really avoiding and minimizing foods that are really quite bad for us. The protective foods, the list is pretty clear, fruits, nuts, fish, vegetables, plant oils, whole grains, beans, uh, and yogurt. The foods to eat in moderation are actually mostly minimally processed animal products like cheese, poultry, milk, eggs, butter, and unprocessed red meats. Cheese may be a little bit better than neutral because it seems to be related to lower risk of diabetes. Uh, and unprocessed red meats may be a little bit worse than neutral because it seems to be linked to higher risk of diabetes actually. Um, but on average, those are all foods to eat in moderation. And the worst thing in the food supply is all of the ultra processed foods that are rich in starch, sugar, and salt. And now notice that triple S, starch, sugar, and salt. I didn't say fat, sugar, and salt. There's, it's sort of become vogue in the press to talk about fat, sugar, and salt. Most fat in our, in our food supply is actually quite good for us. We should be eating more healthy fats. It's really the starch, sugar, and salt that's the problem and other highly processed foods. Now there's lots we don't know. And we're gonna get into this when I talk about the emerging science. But I think one fact we clearly know, focus on healthy foods, especially eating more protective foods. Um, fact number two, that a focus on single nutrients, fat or calories can be highly misleading. This chart shows all kinds of, or this, this slide shows all kinds of products which are marketed as healthier foods because they're low fat, because they're fortified with vitamins, because they're baked and have less oil, because they're turkey instead of red meat. You know, all of these products are actually some of the worst things in the food supply for us because they're highly processed. And in fact, again, for most of these foods, taking out the fat has been the worst thing we could have done. I don't know what's in fat-free salad dressing. Fat-free salad dressing, by definition, should have oil in it. 
And if you look on the, on the ingredients list, no surprise, it's starch, sugar, salt, and additives. Baked potato chips, you know, potato chips aren't a health food, but if you're gonna eat a potato chip, for goodness sake, go find the highest fat potato chip you can because the fat that potato chips are cooked in is the only healthy ingredient uh, of the potato chip. And if you're gonna eat meat, you're much better off eating unprocessed red meat and highly processed turkey, you know, sausage links. So, so lots and lots of misleading uh, uh, um, claims made by, by foods uh, based on single nutrients. Fact number three, obesity is a, is a global pandemic and we have to stop focusing on calories. Calorie counting and judging foods by their calories is not the route to success. We've learned that over 40 years practically and we've learned that through the science. More and more well-controlled studies are showing that calorie for calorie, foods have very, very different effects on our, on our body. Food is information, food is biology. And when we eat those foods, they have very different effects on our bodies. And most of it is unconscious. People think about you know, how, how much they enjoy the food or if the food you know, is pleasurable, but, but most of this is unconscious. Most of this is hormones, biology, glucose, insulin, liver fat synthesis, unconscious brain reward, the gut uh, uh, effects on our gut bacteria, even affects on our metabolic expenditure. And so we have to move away from judging foods by their calories and actually try to eat more calories from healthy foods and less calories from unhealthy foods. Uh, and, then, and then fact number four, we have to move beyond obesity. Um, in the 70s and 80s, a lot of nutrition science and a lot of public guidance around nutrition science was heavily focused on blood cholesterol levels. And that's what led to the low fat, low saturated fat focus, which was, was really misleading for, for our nation. Now obesity is the major focus and uh, we're really focusing on calories as the solution as though obesity was the only diet related problem in the world. Food affects every pathway in our body related to health, much, much more than just obesity, much, much more than blood cholesterol. It affects blood pressure, vascular function, inflammation, the brain, the gut bacteria, and, and, and much more. And so we really have to think about your, you know, our overall health, not just our weight, when we think about healthy eating. So here's kind of a quick summary of I think what we've learned, what our facts are. Our food is the top overall driver of health in the US and globally. Food is biologic information, not just calories, not just energy, influencing almost every pathway in the body. All of the science kind of points to a typical overall healthy dietary pattern, which is more minimally processed phenolic rich foods like fruits, nuts, seeds, beans, veggies, whole grains, as well as fish and yogurt unprocessed animal products in moderation and to avoid highly processed foods, especially those rich in starch, sugar, and salt. For long-term weight control, it's gotta be about quality, not calories. Um, a healthy, well-fed gut microbiome is absolutely central to good health. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more. And with rare exceptions, we didn't talk about this, but, but happy to do this in, in the Q and A, supplements can't replace food choices because um, you know, we still have not figured out how to extract exactly the right nutrient and replace a, a whole healthy food. Now, what about myths? These are the myths. Avoid fat and saturated fat, avoid all carbohydrates. We need more protein in our diet. All these protein bars and protein shakes and, and plant-based protein alternatives are important for health. Red meat is either the most toxic food out there, or it's really, really good for you. Both of those are myths. A plant-based diet is the best choice for health. Another myth, nutrition is highly personalized. It's all individualized. We can't say anything about an individual's diet. That's also a myth. Seed oils like canola and soybean and others are toxic. And no, 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 it's not the food itself. It's all the pesticides and the hormones in our food. All of these, I think, are, are myths. I'm not going to be able to cover all of them, but just some high-level summaries. Why do I say it's a myth that we should focus on fat and saturated fat? Well, Lots and lots of studies have, have shown this. This is one paper published uh, from, from our group now more than uh, almost 10 years ago, looking at the association between higher or lower intake of saturated fat from different food sources uh, and risk of cardiovascular disease. And what we found is that higher saturated fat intake from meats was linked to higher risk of cardiovascular disease, uh, uh, as you can uh, see in the red, uh, and higher risk of saturated fat from dairy sources, actually, which you see in the green, was associated with lower risk of cardiovascular disease, risk below uh, an even risk of 1.0. And so the food source matters more than the saturated fat content. This is another paper. I won't go into all the details, but you know, diamonds above one suggest that the food was linked to higher risk of diabetes, 
diamonds below one suggests that the food was linked to lower risk of diabetes. If you look at total fat or even total saturated fat, they were actually linked towards trends towards lower risk of diabetes in the study. But then they started to break it out into different foods. Total dairy also associated with lower risk of diabetes, but then break this out. Low fat dairy, which you've taken out the dairy fat linked to higher risk of diabetes, whole fat dairy linked to lower risk of diabetes. Start to break it out even further into fermented and non-fermented dairy. And in fact, the most healthy food seems to be fermented whole fat dairy foods. And the least healthy seems to be low fat or non-fat, non-fermented dairy foods. And then red meat pops out in contrast to dairy as being linked to higher risk of, of incident diabetes, as I've mentioned before. So really the food source mat matters much more than just trying to reduce saturated fat. What about carbohydrates? You know, there's now it's in vogue to, to say, we just got to cut out all carbohydrates. Now, on the one hand, I don't totally disagree with that because most carbohydrates in our food supply are terrible for us because they're highly refined, highly processed carbohydrates, not just sugars, but also starch. And so almost everything on this, on this chart, um, with the exception of maybe the, the yogurt at the bottom, if that's steel cut oats, is highly processed um, you know, carbohydrates, starch and sugar, which seem to be linked to high risk of obesity, weight gain, type two diabetes, and adverse effects on the microbiome. Um, but there's also healthier carbohydrates. And so, so one of the challenges, one of the emerging areas for emerging science, we really have to understand how to define healthier carbohydrates. It's not straightforward. You could define it based on the whole grain content. Does the food actually have endosperm, bran, and germ? You could define it based just on the fiber content, which is really about, about the fiber in the bran. You could define it based on just the glycemic response, which is a combination of the whole grain content and the processing. And so for example, a whole grain cereal like Cheerios, which is, which is whole grain, tends to be more processed and so it'll have a higher glycemic response. Whereas steel cut oats, which nutritionally appear similar, have a lower glycemic response because they have intact cellular structure. And you could also define carbohydrates just basically simply on is it liquid or solid because liquid carbohydrates in particular soda seem to be much, much worse than solid carbohydrates. We need to figure this out because right now it's a little bit unclear. And so I think, you know, again, this is an emerging area, but I think it's a myth that all carbohydrates need to be avoided. Certainly sugary, highly processed carbohydrates, we all kind of understand should be avoided. I think that's clear. I think in addition for most people who are, you know, at risk of obesity or type two diabetes or pre-diabetic want to lose weight, which again, which is the majority of Americans, probably even complex carbohydrates, refined starch should be considered a treat, should be considered a side, should be considered to be minimized, you know, not totally avoided, but minimized and made a much smaller portion of the diet. But I do think there's good evidence that phenolic rich, fiber rich um, foods that maintain their cellular structure that have carbohydrates like beans, fruits, um, legumes, uh, and, and other foods are actually probably quite good for us, even for risk of, of long-term obesity, diabetes, uh, and, and weight gain. What about protein? I mentioned at the beginning, this is a huge, huge myth that's just out there that we all need to eat more protein and that, and that you know, we need to eat protein bars and I gotta make sure I have protein in the morning with, with my breakfast and that protein is more satiating. There's almost no evidence that this is true. And this is one uh, a study, which is a meta-analysis. Each of the lines on this chart are individual studies looking at higher or lower protein intake and risk of diabetes. Almost all of these studies showed that people who eat more protein intake have a higher risk of onset of diabetes. And if you put all the studies together, it was highly statistically significant. People who eat more protein have a higher risk of diabetes. Why is that? Well, what happens when you eat too much protein? It gets turned into fat. Obviously, if you're exercising and you're in a strength training program and you're building muscle, then when you eat protein, it turns into muscle. And so people who are bodybuilding and trying to gain muscle mass, yes, eating protein does lead to more muscle mass. But for the majority of us who are not exercising and are not in a robust strength training program to build muscle, when you eat more protein than your body needs, which is, again, most Americans are actually probably already eating more protein than our body needs, what happens to the protein? It goes to the liver and it actually gets turned into fat in a process called de novo lipogenesis. And so just like sugar gets turned into fat when you eat too much of it, just like refined starch gets turned into fat when you eat too much of it, protein gets turned into fat when you eat too much of it. This is an epidemic in our country. One in four 
US adults have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. One in four from eating too much refined starch, sugar, and yes, also protein. And one in 16, one in six teenagers have fatty liver disease from eating uh, too, much, um, uh, too much refined starch, sugar, and, and also protein. So we don't need more protein in our, in our diets. We need healthier foods in our diet. What about red meat? It's a myth that this is the most toxic thing in the food supply and we have to eliminate red meat and we have to all be vegans to be healthy and there's nothing redeeming about red meat. Yes, that's a myth. It's also a myth that we should be eating more red meat as a, as a major health food. And this is absolutely the thing we should be focusing on. And we should be eating three servings of, of red meat per day. Also a myth. Red meat is more or less kind of a, a, a neutral food. It's worse than fruits and, and beans and fish and yogurt. It's better than starch and sugar and, and you know, highly processed and packaged refined starch foods. But on average, it's, it's kind of a neutral food. This is a meta-analysis we published now 11 years ago, showing that for red meat and heart disease, unprocessed red meats, fresh red meats, steak and hamburgers that are freshly prepared and cooked, have no association, a relative risk of 1.00 with onset of heart disease, which has the, been the major concern about, about red meats. Whereas in contrast, processed meats, which are preserved with salt and nitrates and, and, and high temperature cooking like bacon and salami, and also all of the low fat you know, luncheon meats, low fat turkey and ham and chicken and poultry are significantly associated with higher risk of heart disease, probably because of all the processing. So when you think about red meat, you know, it's not again, the, the most toxic thing and you have to eliminate it, but it's also not something you should really seek out and eat for health, probably one or two servings of unprocessed red meat a week is a good, you know, appropriate balance for most Americans. Um, and so really the question shouldn't be about lean red meat or fatty red meat. It should be about processed versus unprocessed. Unprocessed red meat, you know, one or two servings a week, okay. You don't have to eat it. You could get the nutrients elsewhere, but if you like red meat, that seems to be okay. Processed red meats, that's a treat, you know, Think of it as, as a very occasional, you know, uh, occasional treat. So those are some of the, you know, high level nutrition myths. You know, uh, we didn't get into some of the other ones. A plant-based diet is the best choice for health. Why is, do I say that's a myth? Well, most of what's toxic in our food supply is from plants, all of the refined starch, sugar, and salt. And so plant-based alone is not a, a good recipe for health. If you say minimally processed, whole food, phenolic rich, fiber, rich plants. Yes, I would agree with that. But then you could also add to that some yogurt, some fish, uh, some cheese, um, and make that diet uh, even better. And so, and so, you know, plant-based alone is not, is not the right answer. Uh, nutrition is highly personalized with no one size fits all. Why do I say that's a myth? Well, hopefully we can talk about that more in the Q and A, but it's of course true that there's inter there's, there's individual variation in response to nutrition. There's also individual variation in response to surgery, individual variation in, in response to smoking, individual variation in response to physical activity, individual response and variation to air pollution, individual variation in response to, to having you know, contaminated bacteria in a hamburger. There's individual you know, response in, in everything in the world, but that doesn't mean there aren't truths for what on average is important for being a human. On average, for being a human, physical activity is good for you, sleep is good for you, tobacco is bad for you. We know broad truths around nutrition. And so while personalization will be important for kind of the details and um, you know, the, the, the incremental um, extra uh, important you know, nuances, big picture, we do know what's good for most people on the planet. Um, I won't get into the other nutrition myths because of time, but again, if there's questions about that, happy to discuss that. Now, lastly, what about the science gaps? So much we need to learn. Every year I'm in this field, I mean, I've been studying this for more than 25 years. There's more and more gaps, it seems, than, than knowledge. You know, top science gap, what defines a healthy microbiome and why? This is absolutely essential. Number two, we know highly processed foods are bad on average, but why? What is it about the processed foods that's actually bad? And most importantly, what would optimal processing look like? We have to figure out how to optimally process foods because we need processed foods in our food supply for shelf stability, for cost, for shipping, for feeding the world of 9 billion people. How do we optimally process foods? Another science gap, are natural foods always better than processed foods? I don't think so. I don't think the evidence supports that. Sometimes a more processed food will be better, but, but why and, and how? What are actually the specific compounds and foods that improve health? 
there are thousands and thousands and thousands of nutrients in foods that we're just starting to catalog and understand. Nutrients that are in things like cocoa and coffee and green tea and nuts uh, and seafood and dairy foods and, and many other um, foods that we're just starting to understand. What are the effects of the timing of meals? Intermittent fasting versus grazing, you know, huge gaps in this. How important is personalized nutrition? I mentioned it's a myth that it's all important. It's certainly not all important, but I do believe personalized nutrition will be important for some people, for certain circumstances, for certain conditions. We need to understand that better. What are all the health effects of, of the common additives? We know salt and sugar are bad, but what about all of the emulsifiers, stabilizers, artificial sweeteners, artificial colors? I kind of used to poo-poo that thinking, oh, those probably aren't that big of a deal, but there is emerging science, animal experiments mostly, suggesting that common stabilizers, emulsifiers, and artificial sweetener colors could have adverse effects on our microbiomes and health, but it's still not well understood. And then beyond obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, which I think we know a lot about, how does, the burn, how does nutrition influence so many other organs in our body? What do we really understand about nutrition in the brain, immunity and immune function, cancers, and, and much, much more. The gut microbiome. This is a top, top area. We need much, much more science in this. We need a huge national and global investment to understand this. There are more gut microbiome cells in your body than human cells. If you just count the cells, you're more uh, uh, bacteria than, than human. And clearly, clearly the gut microbiome broadly is linked to many, many health outcomes, obesity, diabetes, asthma, arthritis, irritable bowel syndrome, psoriasis, dementia, wasting and stunting, maybe even autism, many other diseases. And clearly food is the top driver of microbiome composition and function, both the types of bacteria you have in your gut and how they function. But what do we actually have to do to our food to be sure that we have a healthy gut microbiome and how does that affect health? I don't think we quite uh, understand that yet. And so lots and lots of work to do on the gut microbiome. Processing, I mentioned, another huge area of interest. This is a nice randomized controlled trial. The blue shows uh, uh, people on, on an ultra processed food diet. The red shows people on an unprocessed food diet. These are the same people randomized on in different periods to an ultra processed versus an unprocessed food diet. The diets were matched in available calories, sugar, fat, sodium, carbohydrate, protein, palatability. So the differences here were not in sugar or fat or salt, were not in macronutrients. The differences here were just in processing. And what happened on the ultra processed diet, the same people ate about 500 calories more per day on, on the left side of the slide, and they gained weight even unconsciously without thinking about it. They gained a kilogram in just two weeks. On the unprocessed diet, unconsciously people ate less and actually lost weight. Why? We don't actually know Clearly, I, I think one of the most likely explanations is the concept of acellular nutrition. Processed foods lose their intact cellular structure. You've taken food that we've evolved to eat in its intact cellular structure, and you've broken out the food and, and separated it into all of its different pieces. And again, a typical whole grain cereal or a typical whole grain bread is a good example of that. It's still a whole grain. It's on average probably better for us than, than other refined starches, but it's been broken down. And there's more and more interesting evidence that, that acellular uh, carbohydrates in particular are mostly or fully digested in the stomach and small intestine, which leaves nothing getting to the large intestine, no nutrition getting to your gut bacteria. So you starve your gut bacteria. What do unhappy gut bacteria do? They cause inflammation. They cause elevated permeability of the gut membranes. They elevate uh, inflammatory um, uh, compounds from, from your gut bacteria in your circulation. They cause what's called metabolic endotoxemia in your blood after you eat. So I really think that, that the food structure and this concept of acellular nutrition is going to be very, very important for us to understand and to try to return to foods that have more intact cellular structure. But it's an area of emerging science and we need to learn more. Natural versus processed foods, right? This is a huge area of debate now. On the one hand, I think we've come a long way in the last 20 or 30 years. People recognize that highly processed foods are bad for them, but there's a limit to that. There's a limit to using that as a golden rule. And you know, butter versus a healthy margarine is a good example. Many people today on social media will say, oh, I'm going to eat butter before I'd ever eat a margarine. I know it's a, a healthier food. 
I don't think the science supports that. If you go to you know, a, a manufacturing plant and how they make butter and you go to a manufacturing plant and how they make kind of a modern margarine, it's essentially the same plant. One is taking animal fats and turning it into butter. One is taking fats from nuts and seeds and fruits and turning it into butter. And again, this particular you know, margarine, which, which in full disclosure, you know, my family really enjoys. If you look at the ingredients, it's palm fruit, canola oil, soybean oil, flax oil, olive oil, filtered water, salt, some natural flavors. Um, it's actually pretty darn healthy ingredients, all oils that are quite good for us. So I'd actually think, really believe that the margarine is better than, than butter in that case. You know, another thing that has been up in the social media lately is what about, you know, eggs or steak compared to a processed whole grain cereal? While, you know, again, natural on average might be better for us, there's really no evidence that eggs are a health food. They're probably not bad for you. They're probably not good for you. They're perfectly fine to have once in a while. Same with the steak. As I mentioned, it's probably kind of neutral in the middle on average. But there is evidence that whole grains are actually good for us. Um, whole grains reduce uh, blood pressure. They reduce blood cholesterol. They, they uh, are linked to lower long-term weight gain. They're linked to lower risk of cardiovascular disease, lower risk of colorectal cancer, lower risk of, of diabetes. And so, yeah, on average, probably, um, you know, um, re refined, uh, a refined breakfast cereal that's whole grain is probably better for us than eggs for breakfast, but it would be even better if you added nuts and fruits and other minimally processed foods to it. And of course the eggs would be even better if you cooked it with a healthy plant oil and added, added vegetables. But this is an area for more study. What, when, when does the line between natural and processed uh, get crossed between what's healthy and not healthy? Um, and lastly, the thousands and thousands indeed millions of phenolics that are in foods. This is from a, a company, Brightseed, that's part of the Tufts Food and Nutrition Innovation Council, a startup in California. They have documented uh, from about 100,000 measured nutrients in food that we knew about um, up to now 1.2 million compounds in food. So again, we, we used to, you know, five years ago, we had measured about 100,000 different nutrients in food Brightseed has taken this to 1.2 million compounds in food. And this is a map that they're now mapping out all of these, these hundreds of thousands of compounds, how they might have significant health benefits, anti-inflammatory, antiviral, antioxidant, bone and joint health, on and on and on. We're just learning about the power of food uh, as food is medicine. So those are some of the key science gaps. Again, there's, there's others about the timing of meals. I think there was a question on that. We'll get to that much, much more, we'll, we'll get to that. So how are we gonna address all of this? I just wanna end by saying, we absolutely have to have a, a national moonshot for nutrition science. We must invest at least a billion dollars a year, if not $2 billion a year to create a national institute of nutrition at the NIH to really advance this research. We can't keep going at the pace that we're going and wait 50 years to figure all this out. We can literally send a man or woman to the moon and I can't tell you whether cheese is good or bad for you, for your health. That's not okay, right? We have to be able to figure this stuff out. We need a National Institute of Nutrition. For people who are interested in, in you know, what should I do now? Please look up online, just do a Google search for the Tufts Healthy Food Guide. Uh, maybe someone can put it in the chat. This is something that Tufts faculty have, have built as a beta version, a simple chart that the chart has other categories of kind of foods to, to focus on, foods to avoid. I think the Tufts Healthy Food Guide is a great resource for you to just kind of think broadly about healthy foods. And also I encourage you to get a subscription to the Tufts Health and Nutrition Letter, which comes out monthly, has lots of really good cutting edge, evidence-based, science-based vetted articles, rather than the, the crazy world of the internet, you know, not knowing what's, what's real and what's not, I encourage you to go to that. Um, and so I think there's real action here. And just this week, there was a Senate hearing, the first hearing in 50 years on the state of nutrition in America. I was honored to be able to be the lead witness at that, at that hearing led by Senator uh, uh, Cory Booker and Mike Braun. And you know, two of the things I said is we have a legacy food system built for 20th century goals, but with 21st century problems. And it's time to fix food. We can only do this if we actually have a plan, a harmonized national strategy. Uh, at Tufts, we're working really hard to try to come up with a national plan to fix food. So thank you for your attention. Uh, and I look forward to time for our questions and conversation. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Dean Mosaferian. Uh, that was a whirlwind of information, and we are so grateful for all of the 
nutrition facts and myths that you just sent our way. We have a lot of questions as I'm sure you are prepared for. Um, one of the first things I just want to highlight though, is from our very first poll question, what are people eating to be healthy right now? And the number one food item that came up was vegetables. And there were others like whole grains, berries, protein, fruit, plant-based, they're eating oils. And the question that has come up kind of in response to much of these answers is something that you were touching on a little bit earlier about what are the foods that should be making the sort of base of what we eat on a day-to-day -day basis. And something that came up a lot in the chat was what about sugar from things like fruit? Should we be concerned about the individual nutrients? And I know that you talked about carbohydrates and sugar and protein. Should we be concerned about the nutrients, particularly the sugar that comes from fruit? And based upon our polling questions, should we be leaning toward vegetables instead of fruit or are we splitting hairs there? Okay, great question. So, so first, you know, big picture, if, if that were the battle and the discussion between fruits and vegetables, right, that's a win. Uh, if that's really, you know, where we're focusing, we're all eating too few, you know, few fruits and vegetables, whichever one we choose, so big picture. But if you are going to com compare them, um, I would choose fruits over vegetables, hands down. Um, and I say that with um, the additional, um, you know, fact that most vegetables are actually fruits. Uh, and so, you know, anything with a seed is a fruit. And so squash, pumpkin, avocado, uh, uh, tomatoes, cucumbers, um, bell peppers, right? You could go down the list and almost everything that's not a leaf or that's not a root vegetable is actually a fruit. Why do I say that? I think the common denominator of foods that make us healthier are, um, um, for most foods that make us healthier, are foods that give rise to life. Foods that you, you take them and you plant them in the ground and they give rise to a new plant life. Those foods, beans, nuts, seeds, whole grains, most vegetables that are actually fruits, they have thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of nutrients in them to nurture that new plant life to, to a successful growth uh, in, in the harshest of environments. Those, I think, tens of thousands of, of nutrients along with the fiber, along with the intact cellular structure are what human bodies need with aging. Other vegetables that aren't fruits, like leaves, have fiber and some nutrients, but they don't have usually those rich phenolics. And root vegetables certainly you know, can have some healthy nutrients, but have fewer nutrients and more starch than really all of the other fr fruity vegetables. So I think fruits and nuts and seeds, I would put right at the heart of my word cloud. Um, and again, that's with you know, including most vegetables that are actually fruits in the fruits category. Vegetables, I would put with whole grains and beans, um, uh, you know, kind of right, right close by, but, but um, I, I think fruits are, and nuts and seeds are right up there. And, and in terms of the sugar and fruits, you know, if you're trying to rapidly lose weight and you have horribly controlled diabetes, yeah, maybe for a few months, two months, three months, you might want to go ketogenic, super low carb, just to kind of you know, get your body for a few months, you know, to, to towards some weight loss. But for general health, we should absolutely be eating fruits. Fruits are linked to lower risk of diabetes, lower inflammation, lower blood pressure, lower weight gain. Um, and the sugar in them uh, is consumed in an intact cellular structure. It's slowly digested. Our gut bacteria digest and eat some of that sugar for us, not just us. So absolutely do not avoid fruits as a, as a general rule. Excellent. Thank you for busting that myth. If I hear one more person tell me that they should avoid bananas. All right. Next question that we have, you touched on this a little bit, but I'd like to come back to it. We've gone through diets where we have lots of carbohydrates, not lots of carbohydrates, lots of fats, not lots of fats, proteins, not protein. We've now entered the phase of intermittent fasting where we're kind of cutting out everything for certain periods of time. Can you talk a little bit about what intermittent fasting is and when it might be beneficial and maybe there's just a little bit of hype around it? Great. Yeah. Well, so first back to the you know, macronutrient diets, on average, if you had to pick a macronutrient diet, I would pick a low carb, high fat diet. But that's again, just because most of the carbs in our food supply are terrible. They're highly refined carbs. If we had all healthy carbs in our food supply, that probably wouldn't be important. 
But in a circumstance where most of the carbohydrate, you know, actually 80% of the carbohydrate in the US food supply is refined, refined starch and, and sugar, going on a lower carb, higher healthy fat diet would be the general rule place to go. Now, what about the timing of meals, right? What's interesting here is there's just not enough science to answer this question. I don't know the answer to this question. There's science that suggests we should be grazing that eating six, seven, eight small meals per day is the best way to go for health. There's science that suggests we should be eating three square meals a day and skipping breakfast or skipping a meal is actually bad. It causes you know, um, um, harm to, to, to people in long-term weight gain and diabetes. And there's science that suggests that intermittent fasting where you, let's say, don't eat for 16, 14 hours uh, every 24 hours um, is actually better. And that's usually done by, let's say, eating an early dinner, you know, at like six and not eating after seven, and then eating a late breakfast or a brunch, you know, and having kind of that overnight intermittent fasting. There's science to support all three of those approaches, the grazing approach, the three square meals approach, and the intermittent fasting approach. And so I think right now today, with what we know, um, whatever works best for you and seems to work best for you as a person seems to be okay. Um, that may be where there's some personalization and, and individual variation. There's no clear evidence to support any one of those over the other on average. Um, and so I think, you know, doing what works for you would, would, would be best until we get more science um, to, to really be able to answer that question well. That's fantastic. I think we have time for one more question and it transitions really nicely into a question about personalized wellness products that are related to nutrition. So I'm sure if anybody's opened up social media anytime lately, they've gotten an advertisement for things like a continuous glucose monitor, a microbiome test, a blood test for nutrition sensitivities, things like this. What are the pros and cons of some of these direct to consumer tests? And are there any words of caution that you would offer to the audience? Great question. So first, you know, as I mentioned, um, personalization is both a myth and it's an emerging area of science. And so I think, you know, the myth is that it's all personalization and there's no truths that are gonna be true for, for, for most of us. That's, that's a myth. We know on average what a healthy diet is, whatever your background, whatever your genes, whatever your microbiome. But that being said, I think personalization is actually very exciting and an exciting area for research and, and a, an exciting area, um, but we have to understand it better. I think the most promising science is around personalization in the microbiome, um, where um, there are you know, um, uh, companies and efforts to try to understand your microbiome with respect to very, very specific things like glucose control um, in, in particular. Um, I think there probably there is some value if you're diabetic or you're pre-diabetic and you're really worried about glucose control. I've worn a glucose monitor. You know, I, I'm not diabetic or pre-diabetic, but I actually found it quite interesting, quite useful to see what I could eat and what I, I couldn't eat. So for example, a homemade cookie with macadamia nuts and dark chocolate didn't budge my blood sugar. And I tested it more than once just to be sure. Um, but popcorn raised my blood sugar, you know, even though that's a whole grain. Um, so, you know, suggesting that the dark cocoa and the macadamia nut in the cookie was more than enough to offset, you know, kind of, kind of the sugar, but popcorn wasn't. So, so I think there is some value for people who are especially worried about blood sugar to consider thinking about their microbiome, thinking about their um, uh, wearing a, 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 a two-week monitor just to learn and, and get engaged with, with, with their bodies. But do we know all the answers? Absolutely not. Like if, if you do that with a company that promises to fix everything just through personalization, that's probably a, a, little, a little bit of hype. We still need to eat a generally healthy diet and so on. So, so I'm kind of, again, on the fence, you know, don't, don't um, go for, for any of the, the, the hype that, that promises to change the world for you based on personalization. But I think there is some value to start to explore uh, uh, some of these things, particularly around blood sugar, blood sugar control. Excellent. All right, I think we're pretty much out of time. Is there one last nugget of wisdom that you would like to leave everybody with regard to nutrition, facts, myths, and gaps in the science? Well, I think one important myth we haven't discussed is, is that all of this is an individual choice and that it's all up to us and that we have to figure this out on our own. That is an absolute myth. When you have one in four teens who are obese, one in six teens who have fatty liver, one in four teenagers who have uh, prediabetes, 
half of the adult population with diabetes or prediabetes, three quarters of the adult population who have overweight or obesity, the system is broken. The system is broken. The food system is making us sick. And so while we do need to learn individually and focus individually and shift the market and shift our, our habits and purchasing. Um, we have to fix the system. If we fix the system, we will, we will you know, fix food for everyone. And we won't have to have webinars like this because all the food will be reasonably healthy and safe and we can actually get there. And so I think that's a big part of what the Friedman School is trying to do. We're a, a school of nutrition science and policy because policy change is really important. And so I think in addition to you know, thinking about your own personal nutrition, advocate for systems change and government, support the Tufts Friedman School for all the work we're doing to advocate for systems change, because it's by changing the system that we're going to create a nourishing, equitable, and sustainable food system for everyone. Amazing. Amazing way to end this off. Dean Mozaferian, thank you so much for your wisdom, for your time this afternoon. And thank you to everyone for tuning in to this Tufts Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy webinar. Thank you.